Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down when you rise up and shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them upon the posts of your house and upon your gate. Psalm 145 David's Song of Praise I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious, and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand, and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him, he also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever.
The movie begins in a small town named Urana in Australia. 16-year-old Bo is cycling back home late at night when he hears a woman crying in a cemetery. She is naked, covered in dirt, and is asking for help. Bo is too scared to approach her, but he hides behind a tree and starts filming a video. Suddenly, he hears another noise and witnesses a man crawling out of his grave. This is followed by several more people appearing out of nowhere. Somewhere else, a police sergeant named James gets a call from an old lady claiming that her dog had gone out of control and killed her sheep. He goes to help her and reluctantly puts down the aggressive dog. The police station gets a call about a disturbance coming from the cemetery, and James, being the closest one to the location, goes to check for the cause. To his surprise, he finds the naked lady, who is very scared and doesn't know how she ended up there. Her leg is bleeding, hence, he calls for medical help. A noise from another grave makes him realize that there are more people like her. Dr. Alicia arrives a few minutes later and helps the sergeant collect all the naked people. The strangers do not resist. Instead, they ask for help because they are terribly confused. After gathering five people, they drive to Alicia's health center only a few minutes away. However, they fail to notice an old man who is left behind. Bo, who has been watching the commotion from the dark, sees him walking away and follows him out of curiosity. Meanwhile, Alicia makes the strangers change into clean clothes and checks their medical condition. James assumes that they are on drugs or were performing some satanic ritual because none of them remember anything about themselves. A woman finds a wedding ring on her finger, which reminds her that her name is Kate. Another person is an Italian man who wanders away because he doesn't understand English. Suddenly, he remembers a glimpse of himself running from something. The glimpse reminds him that his name is Carlo. James calms Carlo down before bringing him into the house again. The sergeant then comes face to face with Kate and freezes. He cannot believe his eyes and has to touch her to find out if she is real. Even then, he refuses to acknowledge her existence because she is his wife who died two years ago. Dr. Alicia asks him to stop joking about such things, but James couldn't be more serious. He brings out a picture of Kate, which makes her remember that she was in fact married to James. She even shows him her birthmark, which confirms she is not just a doppelganger. The sergeant bursts out into tears, overwhelmed by the sudden surprise. Elsewhere in the city, the man who is left behind is wandering around while being followed by Bo. He finally catches the boy and inquires what his intentions are. Bo tries explaining that he emerged from a grave, but the man rationalizes that he must be dreaming. He introduces himself as Patrick and asks to be taken to some place he can get alcohol. The kid doesn't want to tag along anymore, but Patrick forces him to. Back in the medical center, Alicia checks the database and finds Kate's medical reports. According to them, she died two years ago from breast cancer. Kate thinks it is ridiculous, so to get her in touch with reality, James brings her to her grave. There is a massive hole in it, which clearly means that she crawled out of it. Seeing her name on the tombstone, Kate panics and runs away. Before James follows her, his fellow policeman, Sergeant Vic, arrives to inspect the situation. James doesn't tell him about Kate or the cemetery people, not wanting to attract more attention to her dead wife. After that, he calls Alicia and tells her there are many empty graves in the cemetery, which could mean that everyone in the medical center is resurrected from the dead. She is asked to keep an eye on them until he finds Kate. At the same time, one of the resurrected sees the name Anna on a book and remembers that it is her name. Slowly, they all start regaining their memories. A while later, James finds Kate at a park they often used to visit. He apologizes for bringing her to the cemetery and promises to take care of her. This reminds Kate of how helpful her husband was when she was on her deathbed. Patrick and Bo, on the other hand, break into the pub. Patrick has been here a long time ago, hence the drastic changes make him lose his mind. He starts breaking things before the boy offers him a beer. After that, they go to a grocery store and rob it, pretending to be a customer and a burglar. They make friends with each other in a short time, even though Patrick is wildly racist and laughs when he finds out Native Americans are allowed in schools. On the way, they come across a statue of Patrick and discover that he was the first mayor of Urara, who died over 150 years ago. Initially, the old man refuses to believe it, but he soon comes to terms with his unusual existence. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, no, I, 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 you people called me. I'm returning your. Uh, yeah, yes, I am. I do. I, that's me. Um, sorry. Well, I, 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 are you the same person I was just talking to? Seriously, I don't have the reference. When mommy was single in 20, she used to use quarters for this, but now she has to put money into a machine to get a card to put into another machine. Come on. Broke and the entire basement was flooded. I know, the water was totally up to our knees. Ben's exercise that he never uses, the washer dryer. I'm, I'm actually at the laundromat right now. Can you, I don't know, can you squeeze me in at five or something? Yeah, I, oh, hold on, oh, what do you think, there's a button, a red button, yeah, honey, it's okay, baby, yeah, it's a red uh, button, you just, um, oh my god, just press it in with a pen or something, oh, it's perfect, it'll, Start back up. Okay, I'm in the car right now. Can you make the formula? I'm gonna be home and... Sam? 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 Let's go back to the beginning, all right? Because this is really important stuff. All right. So this study discusses the information that the Bible provides us concerning the resurrected bodies, Messiah's coming, as well as the transformation process. That's the correct term, the transformation process. Um, the eager expectation for those waiting for Messiah's coming. And the scriptures 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 47 and 57 so I'm doing you a favor I'm not just sticking to two verses I'm going to read the whole entire section in context so that you can see what the verse itself says so that you know I'm not fooling you Adam is referred to being the first man Adam he was made from the dust of the earth while Messiah the second man is from heaven Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like what? What does it say? Heaven. But what 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 comes after it? They're like what? He heavenly man. Man. The word is man. All right. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. So Yeshua is not being referred to here as an archangel. He's not being referred to here. He's being referred to as the son of man. Even himself, he uses that title. You will see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. All right. So how is he going to come as the son of man? What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical body cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim as it is right now. If I was to see Yahweh, my body is going to burn up and disintegrate. Why? Because I don't have eternal life conditions yet. I just don't. Currently, I am subject to sin and death. All right. So 
These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be what? What's the word? Resurrected. No. What's the word? Transformed. We will all be transformed, okay? It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. You will have what? Life. Eternal life. You're going to live forever and ever and ever. All right? And we who are living will also be what? What does it says? Transformed. So that's the word. We're going to be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed to immortal bodies, meaning it's going to be transformed from this kind of a body to the same type, but now it's no longer subject to death. It's no longer subject to mortality. We know that the reason why death takes place is because of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But when Messiah, uh, when he went up into the Holy of Holies in the celestial realm, what did he do? He separated sin from us as far as the east is from the west, right? He took our burden. And because we believe in him, we will also going, we're also going to receive the same type of blessing that he has as he is right now. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank Yahweh, he gives us victory over sin and death through whom? Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, right? So I want you to take notice, right? This picture is really important for you to grasp mm -hmm. this idea, all right? You see how it's a seed and slowly but surely it it. It converts from a seed to a seedling, from a seedling, it converts into a little baby plant, and then from there, it continues to grow to become a plant, and it bears fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Paul spoke about this, and so did Yeshua concerning the resurrection, as well as the transformation of those who are alive. He compared it to this, all right? Paul compares the resurrection to that of the germination process that a seed undergoes. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. What does that mean to you, Ethan? Do you know? What does it mean to die? Does it to die mean um, you can only be you can only be uh, uh, resurrected if you if you've if you've died? So when you when you die. The 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 um the the seed that was in you was, is grows grows so it's like a like the seed grows right and then it 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 bends because there's a it's subject to the earthly things right but there's a heavenly thing is growing it right good point I like that I like that comparison so the seed becomes a seedly then it becomes a plant consider what Paul wrote but someone will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. So you know how you have to sow your seeds first, then comes the winter. It has to go through a process. And then in the spring, it comes out. Well, in some plant, in some uh, fruit bearing plants, bushes, or trees, example, strawberries, really good example, as well as blueberries, you have to put it in the refrigerator or it has to go go through the winter because it, if it doesn't go through the winter process, the freezing cold causes certain enzymes and chemicals to kick in so that they can then grow. So the death process here is the winter, all right? So 
And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but a mere grain, but perhaps a wheat or some other grain. But Yahweh gives it a body that as he pleases and to teach to each seed its own body. So this seed is coming out with its own body. All right. It's physical. You could touch it. All right. No two seeds become the exact same plant, rather that each seed becomes its own unique plant with its own unique features. If you were to test the DNA of the seed and compare it to the, that of the plant, you will notice that the DNA sequence is exactly the same. If you were to test the DNA of two individual seeds, you will notice that the DNA sequence of both seeds will not be identical, identically the same. Why discuss seeds and plants? When we talk about resurrection and when we talk about the transformation process of the living, why do we talk about seeds and plants? What do seeds and plants have anything to do with the resurrection? What does this have anything to do with the transformation process? Believe it or not, Messiah Yeshua uses this very same model, just like Paul. Messiah Yeshua himself uses this model, the germination process of the seed to discuss things pertaining to Yahweh's kingdom. It says in Matthew and Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29, Yeshua also said, The kingdom of Yah is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground night and day while he's asleep or awake. The seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through, then, the head of the wheat are formed, and finally, the grain ripens. As soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. In fact, Yeshua himself said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death, the death of that seed will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. He even instructed his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Heavenly Father, to Yahweh, who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. So not only do, does, is it talking about the resurrection, but it's also, what does that mean? Well, go out, teach to the people so that they could come to know Messiah Yeshua and become his disciple, a modern day disciple. All right. So what association is there between harvest and resurrection? Paul continues to say, but tell me this, since we preach that Messiah rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is a resurrection of the dead, then Messiah has not been raised either. And if Messiah has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be all lying about Yahweh. For we have said that Yahweh raised Messiah from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Messiah has not been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Messiah are lost. And if our hope in Messiah is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Messiah has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. So what's another term for the resurrection of the dead, as well as the ingathering of those who are left who are alive? It's called the great harvest. Is it called the rapture? No, it's called the yeah. great harvest. All right. Biblically speaking, the Bible calls it the great harvest. Why? Because it's talking about seeds. That's what it compares it to. All right. So Shavuot. See, no, harvest. Ah. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has become has begun through what? Another man. Another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Messiah will be given new life. Is it life? Yes. Are we going to be breathing? Yes. Will we be eating? Yes. But it's a new kind of a life. Eternal life. 
All right. So Messiah was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Messiah will be raised. When, when will that happen? When he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to Yahweh the Father, having destroyed every ruler, authority, and power. For Messiah must reign until he humbles all of his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. All right? So death is not going to be anymore. It's not going to exist anymore. Death, that concept of death is is eradicated. Now we're going to have life that continues on forever when Messiah comes. All right. In essence, the Bible compares those who are buried in the grave. You know how, how when people die, there's a burial, there's a wake, there's a burial, and then the casket is placed in the earth. The body that is casted into the earth, that is compared to the seed. Remember the seed that we spoke about earlier? That is compared to the seed. All right. The Bible compares those who are buried to seeds that are sown into the earth, awaiting new bodies as Yahweh gives it. Just like Yahweh develops the seed into a plant, it's the exact same thing that Yahweh plans to do with those who are buried. All right. And even as these mortal bodies are buried, Isaiah the prophet said, but those who die in Yahweh will live. Their bodies will rise again all right those who sleep on the earth will rise up and sing for joy for your life-giving light will fall like dew on all your people in the place of the dead provided that the people provided that the bible compares resurrected bodies as seeds that are planted and harvested it is important to review the message that john the baptist once gave so long ago as in 3 5, 15 and 17 you can read that. Consider the illustration. The harvester is at the threshing floor. This right here is called the threshing floor. Where, where the seeds fall, that is the threshing floor. The harvester is at the threshing floor. He is separating the wheat from the chaff. He separates the wheat and the chaff by lifting both together up into the air. So you see he uses the winnow, winnowing fork, lifts it up. The wind come, pushes away the chaff. And the seed comes right back down. That chaff is reserved for fire. For fire. That's what's called the baptism of fire. It's no use to me. I can't eat it. I can't. I, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to throw it in the fire. Then with the ashes, they come and they spread it out in the field and they use it again. You know. Then the wind comes and carries off the chaff as seeds drop directly below. In this manner... The wheat is separated from the chaff. John the Baptist compares Messiah as being the harvester. He states that Messiah is ready to do what? Clean up the threshing floor, Luke chapter 3, verse 17. John the Baptist taught that, like the harvester, Messiah will one day be gathering the wheat, the seed, or the resurrected one, ones, along with the transformed one into his barn. Concerning the chaff, John the Baptist taught that the chaff would be reserved for never-ending fire. John, accord, according to John the Baptist's teaching, the baptism of fire is when the chaff is fully separated from the, from the wheat and is casted into never-ending fire. Messiah is coming. So now we're going to talk, what does it mean, Messiah is coming? All right, what does that mean? This section now discusses Messiah coming and the events that he foretold his disciples that would unfold. All right. We're going to be reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13. But now I have an image. I have an illustration. And after talking to you, now you have an idea. Look what it says. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. So that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind do who have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose from the dead, so also Yahweh will bring with him Yeshua those who have fallen asleep through Yeshua. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord. In Hebrew, Alpi Yeshua. 
by the mouth of Yeshua himself, from the very mouth of Yeshua, that we who are alive and remain until Messiah is coming will not precede those who have fallen asleep. All right. For the Lord, Messiah Yeshua himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So here he is descending from heaven on the cloud of glory with a shout, with a shofar, with a trumpet call. The dead are rising up from the grave, right? He himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of Yahweh, and the dead and Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them, the resurrected ones, in the clouds, all right, to meet the Lord Messiah Yeshua in the air. So we will always be with the Lord Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Concerning Messiah's coming, Paul informed his readers in Thessalonica of a sequential order of events expected to occur. So now we're going to break it down as simple as it gets. As simple as it gets. If they ignore any one of these sequences, they're not speaking the truth. A prophet speaks. He stands in the gap. A prophet speaks the exact message, as it is said by the mouth of the Heavenly Father, speaks exactly the word without any mistakes. All right? So what's the first thing that is supposed to happen? Messiah Yeshua himself descending from heaven. That's the first thing. Yeshua descending from heaven. Does he remain in heaven? No. Does he say, come up here, like they teach? No. He descends first from heaven. After he descends from heaven, the second thing that will happen is that Yeshua will give a shout with the voice of the archangel and blow the shofar. That's the sound that he's going to make with the shofar, right? Once he makes the sound of the shofar, the third event is the resurrection of the dead. So what comes first? What's the first thing that happens? Messiah Yeshua descends. What's the second thing that happens? Blowing of the shofar. He shouts and he blows the shofar. All right? He shouts. Yeshua shouts and blows. So it's not a secret event. Everybody got to hear him. Everybody. He shouts and he blows the shofar. And then after he shouts and he blows the shofar, the next thing that happens is the, what? The resurrection of the dead. What's the fourth thing? The ones that remain and are alive will be caught up together with the resurrected ones in where? In the clouds. So is it secret? Are we not going to hear it? No, we're all going to hear it. Remember that video? When do you know that Messiah comes? Oh, we'll hear it. The shofar is going to let us know. We're going to know. The same thing. We're going to know. The fifth thing that's going to happen is that we meet Messiah Yeshua in the air. And the sixth and the last event that will always it is that we will always be with Messiah Yeshua. So Paul said, this is the instruction. This is the word that we got from Messiah Yeshua himself. I'm not making this stuff up. Yeshua taught it this way. And this is what I'm preaching. So let's look at what did Yeshua say? Because Paul is talking about. Hey, I got this from Yeshua himself. Like, you know, the disciples themselves teach this. So let's look at what the disciple says. Because if you notice, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, then you have, you have 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 and 54, right? Because those are the references that was given. Why is it that they don't ever mention that the disciples talked about this? They never do. But let's see what the disciples had to say. Because Paul himself admits, hey, let's see what they have to say. Paul expressed, for we say this to you by the word of the Lord, Alpi Yeshua, or from the very mouth of Yeshua, that we who are alive and remain until Messiah's coming will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4.15. It's apparent 
that Paul was repeating what Yeshua said. And let's let's look at what Yeshua said. It's in Matthews chapter 24, verses 26 and 23. So if someone tells you, look, the anointed one, he's out there in the desert. Don't go out there. Don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here behind this curtain. Don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east, this is the east, and shines to the west, so it shines to the west, the lightning flash, so it will be when the Son of Man comes, the man from heaven. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. What's the sign? The flashing of the lightning. So now there's another example. Yeshua himself said, hey, this is the sign. You're going to see it. So it's not a secret thing. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will become dark and the moon will give no light. The stars will fall from sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign of the Son of Man is coming, will appear in the heavens. So this is a really good example. The sun has no, no shine. It's dark. The moon has no glory. Really good example. And there will be no deep mourning among the nation. Um, there will be deep mourning among the nation, all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming. How? On the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he, Yeshua, will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet. Yeshua himself is saying, I'm going to send out my angels with what? The sound of the shofar. So they, whom? His angels, his messengers, will gather his chosen ones from all over the world. From the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. So where do you think he's going to gather them to? Huh, Ethan? To the, to the kingdom of Elohim, the kingdom of Yahweh. The Mount of Olives. Ah. Uh. When you blow the shofar, what does that mean? It always happens in the beginning of the service. It means, hey, we're about to start. Make sure you come to the very entrance so that we can start worshiping the Heavenly Father. We're at specifically at the tabernacle, at the temple, all right? So was Matthew the only one that has something to say about this? No. Um, look, the, synops the synoptic, synoptic gospels document Yeshua's own statement as to what it is that his followers can expect to see. In the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power, at Yahweh's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. So, look. Yeshua, here's the clouds. Here are the angels, resurrected ones, and those who aren't there going to be gathered up to go where? Mount of Olives. What is it? You will see the Son of Man seated. In the place of power at Yahweh's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Clouds of heaven, clouds of heaven, clouds of heaven. All right. And the more any given person searches the scriptures and look into the matter, the more the Bible researchers understand that Messiah's coming is very much comparable to how he was taken. Let's look at the testimony of angels, because the very angels testified about this to Yeshua's disciples. And after he had said these things, Yeshua, he was lifted up while they were watching, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. So what came and took him up? A cloud. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then beheld two, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Yeshua, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. All right. The same way that he was taken up to heaven, that's how he's going to come back. Then 
they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain of called what? Olivet. Olives. So where is Yeshua going to return to when he comes? Mount of Olives. Isn't that amazing? Where he was taken mm. up, he's going to be brought back. It's in the Bible. This Yeshua who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Pay close attention to what these two men in white clothing, that is the angels, informed those who witnessed Yeshua ascend into heaven. This Yeshua, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way you have watched him go up into heaven. All right, that's what they say. This is the testimony of angels. This is what the disciples who live with Yeshua, walked with Yeshua, knew his likes. They knew exactly what he liked it. I don't know. I, I pretty much doubt that Yeshua liked it chocolate milk. They didn't have that back then. But if he would have enjoyed chocolate milk, I'm quite sure the disciples would have known, right? According to Acts chapter 1, verses 12, those who witnessed Yeshua ascend into heaven were standing where? At the Mount of Olives. Zechariah the prophet foretold of a very special event that many anticipate. Look what the prophet Zechariah had to say. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half of the mountain will move towards the north and half towards the south, Zechariah 14, verse 4. By Yeshua's own words and by the testimony of these two men in white clothing, members of the body of Messiah, anticipate Yeshua to come in the same fashion that he was taken. Members of the body of Messiah also anticipate Yeshua to come specifically to the Mount of Olives. Amen. Amen. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs> Ya erradonai panavelecha vehuneka Yisadonai panavelecha vayasem lecha shalom